here. Please join me in the pledge. so that we can together 
openly, publicly, transparently discuss all three options and the benefits and challenges of each. How, how would the board like to um, proceed? Would you like to take each option that was mentioned and go through them, or do you each have your own thoughts that you'd like to express? Jackie? Of a change 
change um, in terms of the length of our day or the start and end time of our day. Like Kelly said, the benefit would be starting and ending on time. Currently, we are supposed to start at 8.50 in the morning, but we have buses that sort of, we call it a trickle in the back. So they come anywhere from um, quarter of eight to a little bit after, or quarter of nine to a little bit after nine. And then we have buses that pick up at 3.15 and as late as 3.40. So um, knowing that buses would be um, arriving and picking up on time would really be a benefit and um, would, knowing that we have instructional time rather than kids waiting for all of their peers to <coughs> arrive to start the day or hanging around at the end of the day waiting for a bus would be a, a bit more efficient for kids. Kelly, can I just ask, so I just want to clarify that you're saying if you started with a two-tier bus system, if you started at 8.50, you would actually be able to start almost 30 minutes <laughs> earlier than you currently start? So, just because of the, yeah, we, we, we consider students tardy at, at nine because all of our students are not reasonably in the building until nine o'clock because buses are not there until nine. So they should be there at 8.50. Okay. So we still have some that, you know, drop offs maybe at 9.05. The afternoon time is just an even more of a, an unknown. for you and then back to Kelly. Um, I love that you guys are being positive, but are there challenges that you see with this compromise schedule for both of you? And then, forgive me, because maybe I'm not understanding, but this is an only a 50 minute difference. You're feeling confident that they will be there by 8.50, or is that including the 20 minute window? The intent would be for the instructional day to start promptly at 8 a.m. for high school and middle school and 8.50 for K-5. So doors would open at 7.40 for the high school and doors would open at 8.30 for our K-5 schools. And so yes, in terms of transportation, that additional 20 minutes on either side does help us ensure um, that we're able to start the day right on time. And our most recent analysis and testing of the runs we, um, we have our, our average bus run at K-5 is 37 minutes. Currently, under our three-tier busing system, the average bus run is 29 minutes. And so it is, they are, the buses are being used more efficiently and some of the runs are um, longer. But we do believe that this would allow us to start promptly at 8.50 and 8 o'clock. And so we do a two-tier, we did the early release, no, we do not. We do not, but we spaced them out in the same way that the two tier would be. It's just more efficient. Um, so challenges, we know that we wanted to have our K2 kids a little earlier. Um, so I guess one of, one of my worries is that uh, the saturation point of the community with this topic and um, will we be able to move forward with continuing to pursue that? If we compromise now, can we continue to look at that option for kids, or are we going to be kind of stay put with that for a long time? Because I think we do lose our K2 kids at around 2 o'clock, um, and we are putting something on Wentworth that was not there before. Um, so I think looking at what's ideal for all kids, that is a worry. I think we do need to compromise, and I think it's a reasonable compromise, but I guess that's a question that we have to ask ourselves as a larger community. One step, what's the next step? Similarly, for Wentworth, I think it's two things that are challenges um, off, the, off the top of my head. One is that we've planned all year with the staff really thoroughly to um, move to the plan as stated for the 18-19 plan. So this is a shift for us in our thinking and um, kind of going back to 
the drawing board on some things, which we're up for that challenge, if that's what, um, if that's what is decided tonight. And the second is similar to Kelly, that we were also looking forward to an earlier start time for our students and then really maximizing that morning instructional time. But again, it's a challenge that we're up for um, and we'll work through if it's in the best interest of all of our students. Could we hear from the middle school and high school? Hi, I'm Diane Neto. I'm the principal at the middle school. Um, in terms of looking at the compromise and the time difference, um, we currently start at 7.45, and so an 8 o'clock start would really be minimal for us. Um, you know, there were a lot of concerns with the proposed start time on the part of the community in regards to how that would affect our student athletes and their need to um, sometimes be let out of school early for games um, by pushing our schedule only 15 minutes. Um, that would be pretty much um, on a rare occasion because we would be ending our school day at 2.30. Um, there really aren't many places at all um, that we would have to go to that our students would need to leave before 2.34. And so that would eliminate that piece the other piece that would be eliminated um, that was a potential concern around um, the original change in start times is um, the way that we would look at our advisory block, which we call crew. Um, we were going to need to shift that to the end of the day to minimize the impact of the loss of instruction for our athletes. And again, by just shifting our day 15 minutes um, that wouldn't be necessary and we would be able to have it um, in a time during the day that we think is really best um, for all of our students. Hi, I'm David Creech. Hi, I'm David Creech. I'm the principal of the high school. Um, at the high school, we have a number of reasons that are similar to some that you just heard a minute ago from Diane from the middle school. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from our staff and from our school leaders, and it starts with this provides a compromise for our school community, which we thought was extremely important. As Diane mentioned, our AE advisory program currently is between the first and second blocks. That's a model that it took us two and a half years to develop in high school, and it's a best practices model. Moving into the end of the day because of uh, students having to leave because of athletics would have compromised that. So. An 8 o'clock start would allow us to keep the advisory and AEs program ideally where it should be between blocks one and two. After school activities would not be impacted, uh, we wouldn't have to have students missing instructional time during the day because they're being released to have to go to athletic contests. Uh, the vocational schedule will now be more closely aligned to the sending schools. Uh, after, job, after school jobs for our students and our staff that are currently in place wouldn't be significantly impacted as the original plan would. Coaches in our district and coaches that coach outside the district uh, would not be negatively impacted by this. This schedule would align more closely to Cumberland and, and York County High Schools with their school start times. Um, our shared resources, the vocational schools, the athletic schedules, the after school activities would be more aligned with those schools. After school care would be in place for our students who would be able to leave and go home and either take care of their siblings or take care of members of the community or neighbors, that would still be in place. And the final piece that we have as a, as a school group was families are able to make minor adjustments to their schedule with less impact to their existing routines. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? I want to make it perfectly clear that I firmly believe in the science starting school later for our high school and middle school students. However, I believe the upheaval is not good for our students. And that's why I have wanted a compromise. I also want you to know that although I opposed the original start times in the beginning, when it came to a vote, I did support it so that it would be a unanimous vote of the school board because I firmly believe that the board needs to support the policies 
that we put in place. I now think it's time for a compromise, and I would ask that we could move that forward. So it's not significant. So in terms of making adjustments and having a plan, there wouldn't be as much as we'd have to do. Okay. I think um, <clears throat> for after school activities, certainly the compromise allows the high school schedule and the middle school schedule to not be adjusted and minimizes the impact to after school activities. I think um, there'll be an occasion, maybe, when you get into postseason or things like that, that we might have to look at um, an early release, but that's not uncommon to what's happening now. And so I think the compromise does put us in a better situation for minimizing adjustments to after school activities. Many of the plans that we have made, we've been all along thinking about, you know, what if it looks like this, what if it looks like that, all throughout this process. Um, maintaining the two-tier busing really is going to be a huge asset to our community and getting our students to school on time. And this compromise allows us to maintain that. That was a big part of the planning and then testing the plan and analyzing the data that occurred in this in this past time frame. Um, and then as uh, Principal Creech and, Mike and Mr. Legage said, it's really just tweaking that implementation plan that was recently shared with our community, and our aim would be to be able to turn that around in the next couple of weeks so that you'll have you know, that solid document to guide our decisions, or to share our thinking and our decisions, rather. Mary, can I ask, like, regarding the busing, will there be an op opportunity to 
uh, do a trial run of the bus system to see how it goes, you know, you know, moving to the two tier? So we've been testing it for the last month, and that was part of the work that I did just this past week with our transportation supervisor. <coughs> Oh, I see her hiding over there. <laughs> so Sarah and our bus drivers have been testing these runs, the K2 runs. The high school runs stay the same. Um, they're still combined. We looked at ridership. The one thing that would shift for high school and middle school is that rather than getting to a bus stop at 625 or 635 or 640 like our students are now, they'll be going to bus stops at um, their, their bus stop, rather, their pickup will be around 715, 720, um, some 710. Because their routes are much shorter, just given the ridership, we use all 19 of our buses for our high school and middle school run currently. And, you know, they have, on an 84 passenger bus, we can have 71 high school and middle schoolers, and most of them have 60 kids, 50 kids currently. So um, those, those routes would stay virtually the same. We would just be shifting them. So of course we'd be mindful of traffic patterns in towns and adjust accordingly to that. And then the K-5 run has been tested. That's what we were doing during the month of January and February. And so you would have like, you know, how long each run would be, like so you have that information? Yep, we have all of that information. We have the minimum run, the maximum run, the average run, and then each bus stop, we know um, how the ridership will shift and um, how long that ride will take. What's the minimum and maximum run for the different phase levels? So currently at the middle school and high school, the minimum run is 15 minutes, the maximum run is 37 minutes, and the average run is 25 minutes plus or minus, you know, five minutes on any given day, weather depending and traffic depending. At our K-5, um, on our K-5 runs currently, our minimum run is 18 minutes, our maximum run is 38-ish minutes, and our, um, our average run is about 29 minutes. With the two-tier busing system, the minimum run becomes 22, or 20 minutes rather, the maximum run becomes 49, and the average run becomes 37. In, at K-5. And so to give an example, because one of the things I've heard is that our youngest students will be on the bus for two hours a day. Um, I would use my own child as an example. So we live in Scarborough and her bus stop in the morning, she would be on the longest, one of the, the longest runs. Um, so her bus stop in the morning, she would get picked up. Um, this is with our current time, so I would have to adjust to think forward, but she'd be one of the first pickups in the morning. So she'd have a long bus run, it'd be about 40 minutes, but in the afternoon, she'd be one of the first drop-offs. Um, we also live close enough to Blue Point School that, she, that we could walk to school on days that are nice um, or, or drive her ourselves. So we have those options, but the idea, I guess my point in giving that specific personal example is that you won't, your child wouldn't have a longer run, a long run in the morning and the afternoon because typically they're in burst on the way home. So it might be short in the morning and longer on the afternoon or vice versa um, for most of the bus runs. Uh, Is the minimum, maximum, and average for the new system for the 6 to 12? It would stay the same. The routes stay the same because they're already all on the same.
the middle school to the middle school first, or vice versa, or the high school to the high school first, and then drop. Well, so, so wouldn't that add like 10 extra minutes to any bus run? So remember that doors are gonna open 20 minutes before the start of the day. So we could be dropping off as early as 7.40 at the middle school and or the high school. And one of the things we have to consider with our middle school is the bottleneck of traffic, as you all know, when you go to drop your child off or um, if you're a staff member even trying to get through at that time of day. Because we only have one way in around that loop and out, um, we would want to stagger probably one idea that Sarah and I just tested the other day was what if we staggered and we dropped off some some kids at the middle school first and some kids at the high school first so we weren't having that log jam there at the middle school. So those are some of the things that we would test out and we would look at if this becomes um, you know, the best step moving forward. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when, when we started, you, Julie, you said that there were three options. Did the leadership team uh, support one over the other. So initially when we, we met a couple of times last week to talk about this because we were concerned about the community and the impact it was starting to have on our schools and our staff. Um, and we were worried about that impacting our students. Um, so initially, when we chatted, um, our feeling was really the option of keep everything just the way it is right now. Because I think the spirit of our conversation at that time was, you know, we need to just take a step back. We need to really send a clear message to the community that we hear you and that uh, there's no perfect solution right now, but we really need to take a pause. Now that is also not a perfect solution, as we've said tonight, because there are people who have made plans, there are people who have already set up things in preparation for something to change, so I know that that's not a perfect solution. So only you guys can weigh from the feedback from what you hear tonight, after people hear these options, um, and really listen to what people say, you are gonna have to make that decision. I guess our message was stop and listen.
reminder, everyone has three minutes. We talk on the topic at hand, which is start times. This is a special meeting for start times. Um, please line up. You've done a great job with that. Thank you very much. Um, out of respect for the speakers and differing, differing opinions, I ask that you please hold your applause. Uh, no comments on specific people. And please state your name and address before you begin. Thanks. Kristen Nilsen, 23 Morning Street. Last year around this time, I spoke at a board meeting about the importance of teacher wellness and mental health and the effects of change on their ability to bring their best selves to the classroom every day. Later that summer, I ran into our superintendent at Target because I basically live there. Um, and um, she reiterated that she'd heard me agreeing that teacher mental health and well-being are of paramount importance. And I believe that we both agree that that's true. And yet, teacher morale and mental health is at an all-time low at the high school right now. And it makes me really sad to have to say that. Um, this is due to a number of reasons, but at, at the present time, the main reason is that we feel that we have not been heard. Last board meeting, I spoke about community cohesion and the importance of our kids. After all, our kids are why we're here. They're why we're all here tonight. I keep hearing the common phrase, what's best for our kids. I don't claim to have all of the answers, nor should anyone. Although I would start with listening to our kids. This is what so many of us have done. And with all due respect, I think that this is the first time tonight that we are listening to what our kids have to say on the issue of start times. Listening and hearing what they have to say. You've heard the kids, you've heard the staff, you've heard the parents, you've heard the community members, and yet, here we are. You have the ability to compromise on performance-based education, as we have appreciated that you have compromised on that. You have the ability to compromise on the later start times, so thank you for that as well. Um, but let's not lose sight of the collateral damage that these discussions have had. other honors 
also late start times don't take into consideration uh, activities outside of school that can change when they're going to start just because one school changed their start time. Um, lastly, I understand that not every student is in this situation, but I'm a swimmer, so I get up for practice at 5.15 in the morning. So a late start time won't really help me because I'll be having to get up at the same time anyway and then staying up later to do homework and get things done at night. So thank you. Hi, my name is Scott Hardy. Um, I live in South Portland, but I have raised two daughters who have gone through the entire Scarborough school system here. And, uh, and I lived here for most of my parenting years too. So, uh, I wanted to first say that, um, first I, I uh, support the board 100%. I think you guys are working really hard. It's, it's a difficult, you know, it's difficult times, difficult topic, big change. So anyway, I applaud you for, for staying the course and really doing your best. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I want to echo what, what Jackie said about the science and that I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the science and, and really, I think what, where this issue was born was around the health concerns of our adolescents. So, like Jackie, I support the science 100%. Like Jackie, also, I'm in favor of compromise. The only challenge that I personally have is that we're starting at a place of compromise where we're saying, you know, that we're looking at the minimum recommendation from the Academy, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, which says it shouldn't have a start time earlier than 8.30 for adolescents for, for healthy, mental, physical um, life of these kids. So if we're starting with a compromise, I don't think we can go below that number because that is the minimum that the pediatric body of the United States of America says that we should be for the health of our kids. So I would just say that, and thank you. Bye. Deborah Hugh Sherman. Fairway Drive. Um, I have also um, put out emails asking for a compromise, but I must also say, um, as a physician, I totally appreciate your years of work on studying this issue. Um, pretty much every medical society and some national societies, including the National Institute of Health, um, has set that 30 deadline and what's important for the mental and physical health of our children. Change is hard, and I remember when we went to full day kindergarten here, I have two kids, one in college and one a senior in high school, um, so I could have easily avoided this conflict and stayed home. <laughs> um, but when we went from um, part to full day kindergarten, it was a big ruckus in town, um, and that only affected one grade. Um, so affecting all these grades, I don't envy the board's position whatsoever. I'm also as a physician know how it is to give bad news or bad you know advice that people don't want to hear like screening colonoscopies. Screening colonoscopies are not pleasant. They're super inconvenient and they're expensive. But the body of evidence shows that it saves lives. And so people don't like to hear that when I recommend it. It's the right thing to do. Um, so I hope that over this year or over the next two years, we can get to that start time that is recommended by everyone. No society says that we should leave it the way it is, even if it's convenient for some. I know that for both of my kids, it would be different from my oldest. An earlier start time when she was little would have been really hard because she was born a night owl. Um, my other one, not so bad. When they got to middle school and into the high school, boy, I wish they could have had a late start. I know it would have helped their physical and mental well-being. My kid took AP classes. She usually got about five hours of sleep at night because she didn't want to give kind of hard work. Um, there's a lot of kids like that, and I think we have to focus on academics and you know try and figure out the sports thing and the after-school thing, but we're a school system. We need to think about our kids' <coughs> academic um, and mental health, and their physical health, and that's what I have to say. Thank you. This is Vaznik. I uh, live in Freeport, but I work at this 
wonderful Scarborough High School, and um, I feel like I live at 11 Municipal Drive lately. Um, on February 15th, three board members came on a listening tour to the high school. We welcomed them, Ms. Lightford, Ms. Casleonis, and Ms. Beely. We had the opportunity to share our concerns on February 15th, outlining research, background, experience from our experience as teachers, from experience as parents. We had plenty of thoughtful information that we shared. And I know that the listening tour also was at every one of the schools over the past couple of months, which was a great idea to listen. However, when we asked, when I asked, if compromise, that actually was my question. I believe it's in the minutes. Is compromise an option? Are you willing to be the heroes and compromise? It was clear that your team was not ready then. And I asked myself after the following day, learning that our beloved Principal Creech would not have his contract renewed, I asked myself, was this connected, or was it just a coincidence? How is it possible that we are here today if you have truly been willing to compromise, willing to listen? This is what we've needed for a long time. Thank you for starting now.
difficult because it impacts you. And that, folks, is why either of these options are wrong. And I'd like to highlight the fact that the superintendent tonight focuses again on her agenda for a, a mixed guide of, of compromise when the leadership team is asking for a delay. And that's the same request that this, the faculty made on February 15th when Principal Creech was asked to resign. <laughs>
included would have significantly longer days as a result of the initial proposed change and will struggle to get to bed in an adequate time for their sleep needs. This is due to the early bus schedule. I believe high school should start later, but I agree with the middle ground and the compromise. Ideally, we would delay this implementation altogether, but ideally, and ideally high school would not start until after 8.30, but unfortunately we cannot live in a perfect world and we cannot let perfect be, um, be the enemy of good. Thank you.
like to commend the school board and their superintendent for basing this decision on the best available scientific research to date. The AAP released a policy in 2014 recommending that all middle and high school students start no earlier than 8.30. Cited in this policy was a study by the National Sleep Foundation. It found that 59% of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders and 87% of high school students are getting less than the recommended eight and a half hours to nine and a half hours of sleep on school nights. In this study, the average amount of sleep obtained by high school students' seniors was less than seven hours. They also found that the parents were often unaware of their child's sleep requirements and deficits, with 71% of parents believing their children were obtaining an adequate amount of sleep. There have been numerous studies looking at the impact of chronic sleep deprivation in students and children, many of them finding increasing rates of cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Early start times for students have also been associated with increased car accidents. Studies looking specifically at this risk have found a 50 to 70 percent reduction in <coughs> later school start times. After implementation of later start times, schools have seen improved attendance and graduation rates, which can directly affect state funding for the school district. Some parents have asked, does delaying the start time result in the students obtaining more sleep or will they just stay up later? Overall, the studies have found no shift to a later bedtime in the students. And as a result, students obtain nearly an additional hour of sleep on school nights. Parents have also expressed concerns about the impact of early start times for our younger students. Unfortunately, there is limited data on this topic. Recently, two cross-sectional studies published after the AAP recommendations have suggested that early start times may result in lower standardized scores and increased behavior incidents for elementary students. I would like to point out that the school start times in these studies range from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and almost 50% the elementary schools included in the study started before a new elementary start time of 8 a.m. Additionally, because of their design, these two studies do not prove that early start times cause the poor behavior outcomes and lower standardized scores, and they do not convince me to change my support for the new school start times. After spending a year and a half, it appears the board and superintendent have diligently tried to find a balance minimizing the impact of school start times on busing transportation needs, athletics, vocational students, employment, and I feel they have weighed the negative impacts and see the overall benefit to the health and well-being of our middle and high school students. I would strongly encourage families that still have concerns about the impact of school start times on their child's health to speak with their medical provider. They may be able to offer solutions to minimize any effects due to the change in start times. Thank you. Steve Tronsolito. I'm a uh, social studies teacher at the high school. Uh, I've been teaching for 25 years. I've had the honor of being a town employee for the past 10 years at Scarborough. I've enjoyed the students and the staff and the families of this town immensely uh, as an instructor. Uh, two quick comments, just regarding the late start time, first thing. Um, I went to all the meetings last year, a year ago. I was impressed and um, just totally uh, in awe of the brave. Recently, a year ago, a uh, history teacher I remember the past, were the only two voices of reason, of intelligence, of, of understanding the whole, all the sides of the issue, particularly from the student's perspective and from the educator's perspective. Uh, I'm also a parent myself. I live at 15 Cranbrook Drive in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. I don't live in Scarborough, but I have a high school junior, uh, so I understand the parent's point of view regarding education. I certainly understand a little bit of the student's perspective, and I definitely understand the educator's perspective. But getting back real quick, I know the time is short. A year ago, that could have been resolved then. Instead, I remember leaving the last meeting completely blown away and thinking to myself, this is not over. And in the last year, um, we've seen a number of um, decisions that have been made. Currently, we are now seeing some compromise that can be made, which I am very pleased, and I, and I thank you for that. But in the words of Lincoln, uh, who famously said at Gettysburg, uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And quite frankly, policies regarding uh, modifying now the hybrid, uh, the late start, or the kind of the glacial pace is picking up. And my last comment is, if you really want to respect the will of the people and do what's um, expected as town officials is to respect the community of the high school, which is 150% behind 
David Creech. last time I spoke here, uh, our community has been through angst, anguish, and anger. There are four issues here, and I wish Jackie was here to hear them. The first one, tonight you came to a compromise. I, I was blown away sitting there, listening. I didn't hear any of this 11 months ago, not even close to it. I heard the word compromise, Thomas, thank you. The second thing is communication. There's a newsletter that goes out, there are some sub subcommittees, but the communication wasn't there. The PBEs, the high school staff did an incredible job coming up with a hybrid model. But all along, it appeared as though the school board and the superintendent had dug in their heels and not heard anything. I am so saddened of what has happened to the town. And I know I'm a big part of that. For that, I apologize to the town, but I have no idea what other recourse there is. It's the democratic process, because I felt that we hadn't been heard before. We followed the democratic process, and we still are. And there's one last item that has everybody so fired up. You need to hear us one last time tonight, please. We don't know all of the story. The high school principal has been vilified through innuendo, speculation. The bottom line is, so many people in this town are in support of that high school principal. You've got a high school full of students who support him. You've got 100% of the students support that guy. You've got 100% just about the staff supporting him. I don't know what it's gonna take folks to hear us, but we're on that track right now.
looking for expanding educational opportunity, increasing student success, those are things that I do every day in my job, um, and there's nothing more important for this group. This is the idea behind school start times and proficiency-based education, and I don't want to talk about proficiency-based education, but I want to say something a little bigger, which is that sometimes in the course of trying to do the right thing, which is to respect the research around adolescent start, adolescent um, sleep schedules, uh, we get caught up in the fact that we don't live in a perfect world, and our conversations are driven by the budget and transportation and the number of buses we have, um, rather than by that, that outcome. But we can't pretend that we don't face those challenges. And so when we start having similar conversations about proficiency-based education, I think we all need to realize how expensive it is to make these changes. Um, if we weren't so concerned about our transportation costs, the number of buses we had, we could actually start the elementary school children at earlier times. Um, we wouldn't have to be arguing about the transportation schedule and 49 minutes on a bus instead of 30 minutes on a bus. A couple more buses would make this conversation so much easier. So I'm probably going to the choir since you're all here. <laughs> um, but I just want to say that we have gotten bogged down in, in things that have to do with money rather than things that have to do with the best educational outcomes. And I'm short on time, but Proficiency-based education is not going to be any different. It's going to be very expensive to implement it. We should implement it, but it will take revising our whole assessment, our whole teaching and learning, our pedagogy. It works well at Casco Bay High School because they have built their entire school around it. And so um, that's the end of my time. Thank you very much. Hi folks, I'm, I'm Ben Perino, I'm an internist in town and I've been a, in Scarborough for about 20 years now. I've had four kids go through the, through the school system. My last is a junior in high school this year. So I, I got here a little bit late because I was coming from a meeting, but I was, I was concerned because I, was, I wasn't sure if any physician colleagues were up here, so thank you those of you who spoke. Um, I just, a couple things, I, I don't have much to add because they spoke so eloquently, but um, I think I've heard some people quote the American Academy of Pediatrics. They've uh, quoted my sort of more my line. I'm an internist, so I see mostly adults, and I see adolescents sort of at the end of this um, process. But it's not just the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's the American Medical Association. It's the American Academy of uh, Psychiatry. It's the uh, National Sleep Association. There's not equivocation. Some of it may be expert opinion. I heard one of my pediatric colleagues get up and say that, but not all of it. Um, and there's no debate. There is no debate that 8.30 start times are medically healthy for our adolescents. I'm gonna have to just say a couple of things. And this, is, this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. These are the, these are the impacts of, of chronic sleep deprivation in our adolescents on their health. Um, Increased obesity risk, type 2 diabetes risk, hypertension risk, increased rates of motor vehicle crashes, higher rates of caffeine consumption, non-medical use of stimulant medications, lower levels of physical activity, increased risk of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, poor impulse control and self-regulation, increased risk-taking behaviors, emotional dysregulation, impaired interpretation of social and emotional cues in self and others, decreased motivation, increased vulnerability to stress, cognitive deficits, especially with more complex tasks, impairments in executive function, memory, organization, time management, impairments in attention and memory, deficits in abstract thinking, decreased performance, lower academic achievement, poor school attendance, increased dropout rates. So the data is the data, and I think we sort of, it sounds like we've come to some compromise. I think that was presented before I got here. But I just wanted to commend the school board and, and uh, Julie on, on leading this change. This is really hard. I think I heard one of the doctors talk about change being really hard, but it is the right thing to do, and that's, and that's, that's, a, that's not equivocal. Uh, just a couple of things. I heard one of the students talk about AP courses. So my son took five AP courses his senior year, and uh, his first uh, period AP course, his AP teacher, uh, had a nickname for my son. He called him Better Late Than Never. 
it's because he couldn't get up. He couldn't get to those, and he wasn't, it didn't matter, those five AP courses. He was going to bed at the same time before he had AP courses. So I think the sort of, uh, the, the data is there. So even though in those two AP courses, you can do it, and later start times might actually benefit you. Um, uh, lastly, and in, in then I'll, the I'll give up. So I, I don't think actually disagreements divide the town. I may be the minority here, but I don't think, I think disagreements lead to a vibrant town. I think discourse divides a town. If you don't treat people respectfully, if you don't listen to people, if you point your fingers at people, and you, that's what divides a town. That's what divides a town. It's not disagreement. Disagreement in my field is vibrant. We, in fact, I, I'm, I'm one of the medical leaders in my group. I actually pick people to be part of my part of my leadership group that disagree with me. It's vibrant, but we are respectful to each other. When we make a decision, we agree with each other, and we go forward and lead that decision. And we might punch each other in the face, and we might pull each other's hair out in those meeting rooms. But once this decision is made, we go forward. So please, if I could move with one thing for the town, it's not to just have disagreements with the board. That's a good thing. But let's have good conversation and good discourse. And let's treat each other respectfully. Thank you.
until, but it sounds like valid research that we need to listen to. My hope is that we can find a, a plan and a solution that will help our adolescents get the sleep that they need without adversely affecting our younger kids. Um, just my own personal example, and I know that my daughter is just one child, but I've spoken to many parents, many friends, and they feel very similarly that um, the youngest kids who need so much sleep, I mean, my daughter, you know, she sleeps 12, 12 and a half hours at night, so we start bedtime at 6.30 p.m. to get her in bed, that's including, you know, stories and snuggles, she's in bed by seven, and she sleeps until 7.30, sometimes 7.45 in the morning. And as it is, as Principal Lovejoy can attest to, <laughs> it is often a struggle for me to get my daughter to school for the nine o'clock start time because I do so value her sleep. And I know when she doesn't get the sleep that she needs, she falls apart. She may not fall apart at school, but she will absolutely fall apart at home. And I really appreciated um, earlier a pediatrician spoke to that. Um, so what I want to say is just, uh, I, I want to be a voice for our youngest kids. Our, our youngest kids need sleep too. Our youngest kids need to be healthy too. And how can we find a solution that's not gonna so adversely affect them? And I just, I haven't heard, I feel like I haven't heard enough voice on their behalf. And so I wanted to get up here and add my voice. <laughs> so.
The other issue is my older daughter, who is very busy with activities. Um, she really does rely on that time frame from 2.30 to, to her school activities to start um, to get some homework done, so the value of homework time. So um, by pushing her start time later, and therefore getting out of school later for her activities, she's doing homework later at night. So um, to me, that the benefit of her starting later is really kind of a wash because she's going to be up later. Um, so, I just wanted to thank you for the, giving us the opportunity to speak and to hear the compromise. Um, and I just would like to make sure that we consider all age groups when we're considering um, the compromise. <laughs> Hello, my name is Max Bennett and I live at 32 Tall Pines Road. I just want to make it clear that I address you and everyone here with all due respect. To state the obvious, I'm a student. I'm a ninth grader. And not only that, I'm the class president. And I have things to say. <laughs> you know. <laughs> While I don't speak on the behalf of my peers, I just want to take that story. Some of the adults up here have been advocating for us tonight, and they have brought me hope that we will be heard. Although I am glad they are advocating for us and standing up for our rights, I want you to know that these decisions are being made for us, the students. We will no longer be silenced and oppressed by authority. This is our time to talk, and it's your time to listen, and I am not afraid to say that. <laughs> Others tonight have expressed concerns involving science and sleep patterns, but enough of that. It is the students' time to talk, not the research. Students have attended school for years upon years under this current schedule, and future students can do the same. We respectfully request our requests considered and to have our voices heard. Every student that spoke tonight has spoken out against the time change, and I am with them. I am here to protect my rights and my principle, because I will not stand by while we are ignored on my issues. Thank you. Thank you. 